Welcome to Gamecock Pod Live. For the next three to four years, I'll be committed to the University of South Carolina. This is Rogers again to the 25, 20, 15, 10. Rogers scores! Oh, that is a dog. South Carolina is sending shockwaves through the SEC. Where's it at, Professor? That's a win! Unbelievable! I don't believe it! And now, live from Studio 54 of the Gamecock Pod Studios, here's the cockfather himself, Keith Alsep. Hi, everybody. Welcome in to Gamecock Pod Live on a special day on Thursday, April the 4th on Women's NCAA March Madness Final Four Eve. As tomorrow night, the Gamecocks and NC State will do battle. But all everybody's talking about is... Caitlin Clark and Iowa versus UConn and Paige Beckers. That should be something else. In just a few minutes, I will uh, have for you my conversation with Sumter and Bryce, the hosts of the Gamecock Basketball Only podcast. But first, let's jump into our Nana Sports news notes and headlines. Brought to you by Nana's Ports, the award-winning full-service catering company servicing the greater Charlotte area. Whether it is a banquet, a wedding, a corporate event, a big backyard bash with the whole hog barbecue, whatever your catering needs, Nana's Porch has got you covered. I couldn't think of a better time to host a big catering event then this weekend with the final four, if you have an event, you need a food trailer. Nana's Ports voted among the top three in Charlotte by the local newspaper poll. And as we all know, the award winning Pimento Cheese voted number one and number two in the meat and cheese categories by North by the North Carolina Specialty Foods Association. Smoky Jalapeno, my personal favorite, voted number one, and the great regular flavor, number two. So whatever your catering needs, go to nanasporch.com. That's N-A-N-A-S-P-O-R-C-H.com. Get in touch with my good friend Chris Payne. They sponsor our chat box on the show, which, by the way, is wide open for you to jump in with your questions, comments, uh, et cetera. I'll be taking those in the Nana's Porch chat box. But I strongly urge you to support this Gamecock-owned and operated business. If you live anywhere in the um, Lancaster, Fort Mill, Rock Hill area or anywhere in that greater Charlotte area, Nana's Porch should be your go-to for all your catering needs. All right. Gamecock Baseball dropped their first midweek game of the season last night, eight to nothing to Georgia Southern. Uh, The Eagles scored five runs in the second inning after starting pitcher Eddie Cooper departed in the second inning with an apparent elbow injury. He had surrendered a home run, a single, and a walk. He was uh, relieved by Ty Good, who, after striking out two hitters, loaded the bases, gave up a grand slam to Sam Biancato, 
on a fastball that was located down in the zone. The Eagles uh, got another home run from being caught against Dylan Eskew in the fourth inning to make it six to nothing. I mean, game caught pitchers and particularly relievers on the night, 17 strikeouts to just four walks. You would think with 17 strikeouts, four walks, you'd win the game, but it was what happened when the Eagles were not striking out that made the difference. Uh, Gamecocks will, uh, who are now 21 and eight, five and four in SEC play, they will host Texas A&M in a three-game series this weekend uh, that will begin the same time as the women in the Final Four, 7 p.m. It will be streaming on the SEC Network Plus. Okay, it was announced earlier this morning that men's basketball player and uh, SEC uh, all-freshman team member Colin Murray Boyles has inked an NIL deal with the Garnet Trust That was announced earlier this morning. I think that uh, should be treated as welcome news. After our interview with Sumter and Bryce, we'll have more on Gamecock spring football. Uh, Right now, offensive line coach Lonnie Teasley, uh, uh, outside linebackers and defensive end coach Sterling Lucas, and defensive line coach Travian Robertson, are meeting with the media. Hopefully none of them will decline their interview like Marquel Blackwell did last week. But uh, I guess the good news is he is not going to be leaving to go to Ohio State as their running backs coach. They hired Oregon's running backs coach. Also yesterday in Cleveland, uh, it was announced that Don Staley was selected for the third consecutive year and the fourth time in the last five years, Dawn Staley has been selected as the Naismith National Coach of the Year. She made history with that as no coach, men's or women's, has ever won the award three consecutive years. So a three-peat for Dawn Staley uh, as the Naismith Coach of the Year. South Carolina entered the polls at number six after going 36 and one last year. They lost all five starters to the WNBA draft. They lost two reserves off the team as well. And this year, It only took one week for them to catapult back to number one with an entirely new starting five and basically a new roster led by inexperienced players, one transfer in Tahina Pow Pow, and uh, some fantastic freshman guards in Malaysia Fulwiley and Tessa Johnson. South Carolina once again enters the Final Four 36-0, 36-0, and 0. so they are 72-1 and 1 the last two seasons going into Friday's matchup with NC State. And over the last three years, I think South Carolina is 103-3. and 3. I mean, what uh, an accomplishment. So congratulations to Dawn Staley. Very uh, well-earned honor being recognized as the Naismith National Coach of the Year. Staley also holds the distinction as being the only coach, men's or women's, to win the Naismith National Player of the Year Award as well as be named the Naismith National Coach of the Year. Camilla Cardoso, who is projected to go fourth in the WNBA draft, which I believe is on April the 15th, was selected yesterday by the Women's Basketball Coaches Association as the National Defensive Player of the Year. Um, 
So another award for Cardoso, who was also the SEC's Defensive Player of the Year and will play a pivotal role in South Carolina if they are going to cut down the nets and win the national championship. So the Gamecocks are set to take on NC State in a border bash. That will be uh, Friday night at 7 o'clock. But as I said in the open, all the attention is on Caitlin Clark and Paige Beckers, and I think Dawn Staley likes that. And I mean, look, you are the number one team in the nation. You're 36 and 0, and nobody's talking about you, even though you have the best and the deepest team still standing because you don't have one single player that's a superstar, even though you actually have a team of superstars who have been unselfish all season long. And I mean, let's face it, South Carolina has nine players that could start for virtually every team in the country. Four of them just don't get to start for the Gamecocks. Uh, but I will be intrigued to see if Ashlyn Watkins, uh, more affectionately known as Ashlyn Swatkins, is in the starting lineup over Chloe Kitts, who really struggled I thought in the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight, Watkins got an early foul trouble against Indiana, but was fantastic on Sunday. Uh, and in a lot of ways was South Carolina's most valuable players to me in that game, along with Tessa Johnson, who made a lot of critical plays down the stretch. So there are some notables. Uh, put out by Gamecock Sports Information. The game will be called by Ryan Rucco, Rebecca Lobo, and Holly Rowe. Uh, NC State is 31-6, and 13-5 and five in the ACC. Their leading scorer is senior guard Isaiah James who averages 16.7 points per game, and their rebounder, leading rebounder is Madison Hayes. But for me, the matchup's really River Baldwin and Camilla Cardoso because NC State does not have much size at all after her, and River Baldwin is not the most athletic big but Isaiah James went nuts in Portland. And in those two games, in the Sweet 16 and the Elite Eight, she was 10 for 14 from three-point range, including seven of nine in the regional championship game against top-seeded Texas. And she's only a 34% three-point shooter. She is athletic. She's left-handed. Her go-to is the step-back three, but she's got deep range. And uh, I think it'll be interesting to see who guards her and then the matchup with former Gamecock and the only NC State player who has been to a Final Four. And that is uh, Sanaya Rivers. Uh, that, that will be an interesting matchup. We'll talk about that with Sumter and Bryce, and hopefully you don't get the same PTSD as Jermaine Cousinard dropping a 40-piece on the men in the men's tournament. So um, South Carolina's bench averages almost 39 points per game uh, in the NCAA tournament and leads that event. The bench has outscored its counterparts by almost 33 points per game in the NCAA tournament. The Gamecocks are fourth in the nation this season in rebounding average, in, uh, averaging 46.2 rebounds per game. They won that game against Oregon State in quintessential Dawn Staley 
uh, fashion, out rebounding Oregon State like 51 to 38, but the Gamecocks had 22 offensive rebounds, 28 second chance points to just four for the Beavers and the Gamecocks pounded in over 50 points in the paint, dominating with defense, toughness, offensive rebounding, second chance points, and paint points. That's how the Freshies won. And so this team has shown they can blow you out by beating you from behind the three-point line, by fast breaking you to death, by taking you off the dribble, or by pounding you inside with – Cardoso, Watkins, Fagan, Chloe Kitts, uh, and then the guards off the dribble. Malaysia Fulwiley, Tessa Johnson, Breezy Hall. It's just been tremendous to watch. Um, the Gamecocks lead the NCAA tournament with 45.3 rebounds per game. And in addition to Cardoso, 8.7 rebounds per game and Swatkin, 7.3. Sonia Fagan has averaged 6.5 rebounds per game in the tournament. Nine Gamecocks average at least 7.3 points per game in the NCAA tournament. With 11 blocks in the tournament, Ashlyn Watkins has already moved into fifth place in program single season history with 88 blocks on the season. She is the leading shot blocker on the team. And freshman Tessa Johnson entered the NCAA tournament averaging just under six points per game but has been instrumental. She averaged 11 points per game and hit some big time shots down the stretch and some big time critical crunch time free throws in the win over Oregon State and averaged 11 points per game in the Albany Regional. And I really thought she probably should have been all tournament because of that. All right, um, let's get to my interview, which uh, because of their schedule, Bryce was on his way to Cleveland early this morning. All the media is already from the local media is there. We will have Chandler Mack on tomorrow as we continue to preview the Final Four Uh He'll have a lot of uh, good tidbits from the media events yesterday and uh, today, and we will make some picks. As we will do on this, we'll look back on the Albany One Regional. We'll look at the matchups, South Carolina and NC State, Iowa and UConn. We'll break those down, and we will make – our picks, and then on the other side, I'll have more on Gamecock football. And so here is my interview with Sumter and Bryce, the hosts of the Gamecock Basketball Only podcast. All right, and we welcome back in the Gamecock pod why my good friends Sumter and Bryce, the hosts of the Gamecock Basketball Only podcast. I highly recommend if you're not already following them on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, that should be an immediate follow, okay, and a five-star rating. Bryce Sumter, great to have you back on the Gamecocks. Define the odds, heading back to their fourth straight Final Four. Dawn Staley yesterday named 
winning the Naismith National Coach of the Year. The first time a coach, either men's or women's, has won that award three straight years and now four of the last five. And she's also the only male or female to be the Naismith National Player of the Year and the National Coach of the Year, Naismith National Coach of the Year. And so a spectacular season, but there were some problematic issues in both games of losing double-digit leads. But first, just off the top, Sumter and then Bryce, just your thoughts on the Gamecocks getting back to the Final Four and once again being 36-0 and headed into the national semifinals on Friday, the first game, 7 p.m. in Cleveland. Yeah, Keith, it's kind of incredible. Um, they, uh, they, like, none of us, none of us thought they would be this good. I, I remember any time we did a preview pod um, at the start of the season, just getting back to the Final Four was the dream. And I'll tell you, there's still something left on this season. You, you know, if, if they lose to NC State, that's the, the, the that will not be considered the dream. Um, the, and and uh, like it's they're undefeated. They've got the opportunity to be what is it? One of the 11 undefeated seasons in the history of uh, women's college basketball. And it's kind of like that the speech in the movie Miracle before before the Russia game where he says great moments come from great opportunity. And that's what you've earned. And that's what the Gamecock women's basketball team is is looking at this weekend. They have the opportunity to be considered one of the greatest women's basketball teams of all time. They've got to go out there and take it. They've got to take care of business. They got to beat NC State. They got to beat Iowa or UConn. And uh, yeah, it's it's kind of unbelievable that we are potentially talking about one of the best women's basketball teams of all time after they graduated all of their players last year. It's just I'm shocked. Still, I, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that the team is this good. Still, I'm still kind of in disbelief. Well, if you think about it, all right, I Bryce. Thought, yeah. Because beginning of the year, Sumter and I were doing some preview pods, and it would have been shocking to us to say at this time in the year, going, is it possible for this team to be better than last year? And I thought I was afraid, like it was blasphemy to say that early on. But I'm, I can say this proudly: this team is better all around than the team last year, and that's shocking. With it's a mix of older players and young players. And Don talked up Malaysia full while like she was a generational athlete. She is. The Curry brand acknowledges that with her deal that she got. Um, Tessa Johnson, who was just known as a three-point shooter has turned into an all-around player. I mean, it, Bree Hall doesn't have to get all the points every game. Bree Hall just makes big shots when big shots need to be made. It's just, it's amazing. Tahina Pow Pow coming in, when she hit the transfer portal, it was TCU and a few other universities until Dawn called. Not many people wanted her. She's, the, what at most of the year, the number one, three-point shooter percentage-wise, majority of the year. And then any time that she doesn't do well, you have Raven Johnson, who was a terrible three-point shooter last year. And she's – would you say she made one of the biggest shots of the tournament so far when we were only up two? And was it a minute, minute left or so? And she hits the big three to beat Indiana? It's just this team is all around just winners. Everyone shows up. And if someone doesn't show up, someone steps up. It's just the definition of a team game. You know, all these other ladies that get all the press are the ones that score all the points, play all the minutes. We have a team of eight, nine girls that are happy paying 15 to 18 minutes a game. And no one complains. You see them on the bench. They're cheering for whoever's in. It's hard to find weaknesses on this team. You might see spurts here and there, or you'll see the best half ever played in the NCAA tournament against North Carolina that first half. I just, 
I'm out of words on how to describe this team. And you were talking about Dawn and all winning the awards. Dawn can do whatever she wants. I think we're building her a statue at the state house. She deserves it. She needs to get a lifetime contract in the off season. Give her a lifetime contract and let her coach here as long as she wants. And we have something to do. It would be a miracle in my mind to say that we have a chance to go undefeated and be the 10th team ever in women's basketball to go undefeated and win a national championship. It's just, it's shocking. I'm amazed. I'm out of words. There you go. I mean, it has been an incredible season. Dana Pow Pow, 46% from three. And really until this past weekend in Albany was over 47% for the season. She went one for seven um, on Sunday. But, I mean, I look at it like this, okay? NC State, they've never been there. This will be their first Final Four since 1998. Iowa plays six players, double-digit minutes. UConn plays six. Uh, when emergency and you break glass and have to pr play Ice Ice Brady, uh, she did come through against Southern Cal in the clutch. But usually they only play six players. South Carolina, not they're not top nine players, all play 15 minutes or more and nobody plays more than 30 or 32 minutes a night and I think on such a short turnaround it is a huge advantage for South Carolina because if they beat NC State in the early game they get the rest the championship games now moved up it used to be Sunday night now it's 1 p.m. Eastern on ABC, that second game, those teams will not get out of the arena before midnight. Okay, so which means 36 hours is their turnaround until they have to be fresh and ready to play a team that is going to roll in a second wave of players and you don't know who it's going to be. Is Cardoso going to go 10 for 12? Or is Malaysia Fulwali going to score 21 points in 17 minutes off the bench? Or is it going to be clutch Tessa Johnson or Breezy Hall making big shots? Ashlyn Swatkins impacting both ends of the floor. And I just thought we saw this team's versatility. We saw them get after it offensively, and then we saw them win that Oregon State game in Freshie's fashion. They only shot 33% from the floor. They didn't shoot it well from three, but they had uh, 51 rebounds. They had 22 offensive rebounds, 28 to four second chance points. Uh, I believe it was 48 paint points. And it was just defense, toughness, rebounding, offensive rebounding, and second chance points won that game. And nobody's bigger than Tessa Johnson and Ashlyn Swatkins down the stretch. It's crazy Brian to see this team. Yeah, this is crazy to see this team. Just when you think they're playing bad, because every team's going to have spurts of playing bad, you think, oh, here we go, it's going to happen. But the mix of Dawn and the lineup she's using, it's not the same lineup in, 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 cl in cl clutch, clutch time. And you're going, why isn't this person in? Why isn't this person in? Don, what was the player saying? Don doesn't sweat, so we don't sweat. There is no, there is no getting right. scared or worried in clutch time. This team knows how to win, and when you think they're going to lose, they might take it to what a minute, thirty seconds, but they're going to win. And 
I don't get shocked anymore about the wins. I, I will say I was shocked in the, in the SEC tournament when Cardoza banked in a three. But outside of that, I'm not shocked with how we win games. What are your thoughts, Sumter? Yeah, and totally agree. Uh, the strength of this team is that they can hit you with anything. Uh, they can they if they're missing if they're missing shots and the shots aren't going in, they can ratchet up the defensive intensity. They can out rebound you. Um, if the shots are going in, good night. See you later. Um, it, it just, just you're going to lose. Uh, one thing that I loved going back to kind of what Keith was talking about, about the roster and about the depth of this team after the North Carolina game in the second round, everybody was talking about just that there were all these numbers about what the bench did against, uh, you, you know, the bench out, they had like 51 points or something outscored UNC and um, uh, uh, completely, uh, UNC. no one on UNC's bench scored at all. Somebody on Twitter, I forget who it was. I'm going to steal it from him. I didn't come up with this. But he basically said, um, we don't have a bench. We have 10 starters. They all just don't start. And that's and that's literally what this team is. All of these players could be starting for these teams, for, for some of these teams in this Final Four. You know, like, like if you took, if you took some of – some of the players on our bench, they'd be starting at NC State, they'd be starting at Iowa, they'd be starting at UConn. And so, um, like Malaysia Full Wiley would be starting at all three places. Uh, so would Watkins or Car- – so would one of Watkins, Kitts, or Cardoso, whichever one Dawn isn't starting. You know, like – and so it's what, – what, what are you going to do? Like, you've got all these players. You can just beat them however. You know, somebody's going to have a big game. Somebody's going to score some points. And you can't triple team anybody this year like last season. If you triple team or double team anybody, there's someone open for a three because four out of the five girls on the floor can hit a three pointer. Sometimes five. Sometimes, Sometimes five. five when you don't guard them. Yeah. I mean, it really is incredible. So I will say that after Raven uh, said that, Dawn quickly retorted. Uh, you blew a 22 point lead. Um, so I think Dawn was sweating. She just wasn't showing it. Uh, kind of like the duck. What you see above the water is not below the water. And this team has, has given her trials and tribulations, no doubt. But when, I mean, to me, if South Carolina plays their A game, and everybody, every other team plays their A game, South Carolina wins because South Carolina has more players. They have more size, more athleticism, more rebounding, and South Carolina is still the best three-point shooting team in the country. And does yes. that mean they're going to win it? No, because it's a one-game season, right? And it it literally is survive in advance. So, I mean, any cause for concern? Because to me, the way I look at it, and then uh, Sumter, I'm gonna go to you, and then and then to Bryce. I think South Carolina felt the pressure to get to the final four, and I think they did relax a, a little bit against Indiana. They did let a 22 point lead go all the way down to two, but also Indiana was raining threes. Like every one of their players shooting was Caitlin Clark. And then after that 14 to two run that led to a 57 43 lead and a 12 point lead going the fourth quarter, that game gets down to four points before, or Tessa Johnson starts doing Tessa Johnson things and Ashlyn Swatkins takes over on the defensive end of the floor and just felt like she owned every rebound in the fourth quarter. Cause for concern or do you think they put it behind them? Sumter and then Bryce. I think it's kind of, I think you're kind of right. I think it's a tale of two weekends. I mean, the first weekend of the tournament. I mean, everybody everybody thought the North Carolina draw as the as the number eight was was tough for an eight 
team that they had played us as well as anybody had played us all season. And we just beat them for 40 minutes. Um, and, uh, and then this weekend, uh, this, or this past weekend, they got a little, you know, they got these leads. They, they then let both teams get back into it. Um, it, it is concerning. It, it shows that the team's human, you, you know, they're undefeated, but they could have lost either game. But I think the, one of the things, one of the takeaways here is they didn't lose either game. You know, sure they blew a 22 point lead, but they had a 22 point lead to blow. Like, and so that <laughs> uh, if they get up by 22 against NC State, I'm absolutely positive they will be more focused than they were against Indiana or against Oregon State. They, they will they will bring this home. If they get up 22 against Iowa, they will be chasing Caitlin Clark. You know, like like they will be just closing out on her with as intensely as possible so that she doesn't shoot Iowa back into the game. Same with Beckers for UConn. And so I don't think it's cause for concern. You're right that they have to play their game. They could lose. You know, they were undefeated going into the Final Four last season, and they lost. Um, and part of the reason that they lost is they didn't show up offensively, with the exception of Zia Cook. And so if – if they play their game, they will beat NC State. The only reason that we're going to beat NC State, that we're going to lose to NC State, is if they don't show up. And that will be very disappointing. Um, but they should beat NC State. If they don't win the title, it's because if, if they play their game and don't win the title, it's because they, we just witnessed a world-class performance from Caitlin Clark and Paige Backers. Uh, but even if they, if they play their game, even against the world-class performance from either of those two, I still like their chances. And so it it's like I kind of said at the beginning of the pod, this is their time. They have to go out and take it. And as Sumter would say, basketball well, is just a game of runs. And you can't – and what did Lou say? It's not as good as it is or it's not as bad as it is, something like that. Um, Lou's getting so far away. I guess it's been, what, 20 years. Since the loop, but. things are never as good as they seem, or never as bad as they seem. The truth lies somewhere in the middle. And this team, um, I'll admit, after what Oregon and Cousinard did to us and for the men, I am a little worried. Sonia Rivers does what they, she did to UConn in the second game of the season and put what thirty three. I'm worried a little bit about that, but outside of that. Unless someone on NC State goes crazy, we can win with our B a B grade play. If we play at least our B team, a B level of you know, I mean, I mean, you can play our bench, and they're as good as our starters. Like, it's something crazy is going to have to happen. But you know what? It's the Final Four. Everyone in the Final Four is good. You have to bring your A game, but. You know, NC State's kind of the the Cinderella, I would kind of call them, because we have regulars. We were talking pre-recording that, you know, all these other teams are been there, done that, right? Or at least I was there last year. UConn, South Carolina are staples where, you know, the fans buy tickets a year in advance to wherever the Final Four is. It's just as long as we play well and play steady, and guess what? If we get up 30 points – I don't care if we blow a lead down to four or five because you have some said you had the lead to blow. I, I don't want that to happen, you know, and I don't want it to happen like Dallas, right? We got to Dallas last year, and in a few hours we lost, and we were trying to get the heck out of Dodge the next day on a flight. I want us to win, and I think we'll win against NC State. I'm a little worried about Sinai Rivers outside of that. I'm not, but NC State has beaten us before. If you remember, Keith, when's the last time we lost a – a home basketball game. It was in uh, either late November or early December, and Dawn Staley said the team that was on the floor was unrecognizable, and she thought they had to be imposters. And it was during that COVID year where the Since crowd then, was 50, 59 straight wins. Uh, you have that in the back of your mind. NC State was the last team to beat us at home, um, but I don't think they have that 6'5 girl that dominated us that night. But um, it's just – it's a new yeah. game. Completely, new different, completely different right. rosters. 
Yep. And I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. We struggle. The one thing we struggle with is a good shooting perimeter teams. And you saw that with Indiana, Oregon State. They can light it up. We're going to have to get better with perimeter defense. If you're looking for one thing to, you know, the team needs to work on is perimeter defense and getting in people's faces. But I think we can beat NC State and then everyone and their mama wants to play Iowa in the final. But don't be surprised if Beckers and UConn with six players, you know, everyone wants Iowa in the final and every Gamecock fan does too. But don't forget about UConn. They've been there, done that. Yeah. And um, Aaliyah Edwards and Paige Beckers played uh, Monday night just about as well as I've seen them play since the injury started happening to Paige. Like, they they looked very, very good. They're short. They they don't have a lot of players. They get in foul trouble. They're done. Uh, they get tired. They're done. But the, the greatest plot twist of this season is – if on Saturday night, Friday night, excuse me, if on Friday night we watch um, Paige Beckers outperform Caitlin Clark, that would just be, that would be the greatest plot twist of the season where it's just like, who's this Paige Beckers person? Oh, yeah, we forgot about her. She's been hurt for two years. She looks about as good as she has since that sophomore year of hers when we, when we, played, when we played her in the Bahamas and beat her, and she was amazing. She gets hurt. Uh, she gets back for the national championship. She wasn't quite herself, but was still, but was still amazing. And then tears her ACL, and then I think she had an ACL or an MCL tear and missed the whole next season. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I was honestly surprised at South Carolina's three-point defense in Albany because for the season, South Carolina. Opponents, 0. .269, 26.9%, less than 27% on the season. And Don Staley has generally had the motto, we're not going to let them three us to beat us. They're going to have to two us to beat us. And I think that's hard to do with 6-7 and 6-3 shot blockers on the floor. And so I think they will tighten that up. So here, here's another plot twist is nobody nationally is talking about South Carolina. It's all going to be about Iowa and UConn. Okay. Iowa and – um LSU, that was the most watched college basketball game in the history of ESPN. Uh, the only basketball game period on ESPN to ever draw more viewers than the 12.3 million that averaged watching that game was the 2018 Game 7 of the NBA Eastern Conference Finals between LeBron James and the Cleveland Cavaliers and the Boston Celtics, the Kyrie Irving-less Boston Celtics, who had blown a 3-1 to -one lead and lost that series in Game 7. They couldn't make a shot. That's the only basketball game in the history of ESPN that outdrew that game. If you look at it, 12.3 million compared to 3 million watching South Carolina and Oregon State or uh, NC State and Texas on Sunday. The the narrative, every all the emphasis, the push from the national media, it's all going to be about that Iowa-UConn game. And I kind of think that's the way Dawn Staley, I don't think she minds that. Your she loves being the underdog. And then she loves being the underdog. Like, you know, it's hard when you're undefeated. And I know Dawn's probably looking at something and going, I got to challenge them some way. I know they're going to – she can challenge them just on our perimeter defense, giving up what? 13 threes to Indiana. Jeez. 
how many teams in NCAA tournament hit 13 threes at a good clip and lose? Um, but this team, um, they they love the media not talking about them. I think that fuels them at the end of the day. They sit back and go, it's all about the girls that score the most points. And that's what the, the media wants. The viewers tune in. And you know what? This team doesn't bat an eye. And it's not going to surprise me if we go out against NC State and put it to them. And it wouldn't surprise me if we make the championship game to put it to whoever we're playing. Because this team has been a little bit disrespected all year, being the, you know, after what's the second week of the season, number one the rest of the year. And you think the media would be like, man, this team is just unbelievable. But they're tired of talking about it. I think there's game talk, game talk fatigue in the media. What are your thoughts, Sumter? Yeah, so it is weird that we're not that they're undefeated and not getting talked about it at all. Like, I think part of it, like if Leah Boston was still on the team, they would be talking about it. One of the reasons that the media isn't talking about them is that the other teams have stars. Like that Iowa LSU game, that had a Final Four feel. It was it was in the Elite Eight, and that's a credit to – or that's a result of LSU not having a great regular season. They were better than their regular season, I think. Um, you, you know, we can blame that on – there's probably a lot of factors that went into why they dropped some of those games early on. They had a bunch of transfers. They had to gel a little bit uh, and figure that out. But LSU was preseason number one. Iowa was preseason number two. Connecticut was preseason number three. All right. And uh, and so here they are, you, you know, and then we were preseason like six or seven. I, I forget. We were in the top ten. But, um, but just like we were talking about at the beginning of the show, the three of us are as surprised as anybody. I mean, Dawn might even be shocked that they're undefeated, that they're this good. You, you know, she she probably would have said they'd be good. But if she was being honest, I bet she would be surprised that we're potentially talking about a team that's better than last year's squad. And so I think that part of the reason that we're not getting talked about is that the media hadn't really met Malaysia Full Wiley yet. The media hasn't really met Raven Johnson all of a sudden raining in three pointers yet, you know? And so the, or, or Ashlyn Watkins or Chloe Kitts, you know, Ashlyn Watkins playing, playing Angel Reese like defense. And, and, um, and so I think as these games progress, we'll get talked about a little bit more. It's, I think it's a win being an underdog, take care of business against NC, against NC state, let, let Beckers and Clark and the media just duke it out and then take care of business in the final game. Bryce? I just want to say we're going to beat the crap out of everybody. I just wanted to say it. All right. We're going to do it. We're just going to beat the crap out of everybody. And we're going to be undefeated. Everything's going to be great. Um, you know, something you were talking about it, you know, the stars, we have stars on the team. They just have to share the spotlight with 10 other girls. Right. And I'm amazed that Dawn can keep them focused and the ego is not getting mad, right? You think Angel Reese could be on this team and only play 15 minutes a game? She'd lose her mind. Beckers, Caitlin Clark, Caitlin Clark would be crying to her daddy in the stands or complaining to a ref about, you know, why am I not in the game? It's just, is it fair to say this is the most steady, great team you've ever seen? I mean, you've been a coach for a long time, Keith. Is this the most steady, confident, winning team you've ever seen in women's basketball? I know you the UConn girls were good I mean, for four it, straight years. It is at South Carolina. Yeah, I mean, it is at South Carolina. I do think this is Dawn Staley's best team because you add, add the the three-point shooting, the, the, guard, the guard play, and because you did not have nine players, one through nine, on your roster as good. I mean, let's go back to last year, okay? Kara Fletcher was not good in the Final Four. Bree Beal basically 
uh, no offense to Brie Beal, but to me, she had already packed it in at the Sweet 16. I mean, she got drugged uh, in the Maryland game. I mean, the, the Maryland's best player absolutely abused her, and so did Caitlin Clark. And then you play, God bless her, Victoria Saxton, okay, Aaliyah Boston's in foul trouble. Zia Cook's carrying the team. You're down 12 points. You have Raven Johnson, Zia Cook, Breezy Hall, L.A., and Cardoso on the court. They tie the game. Iowa gets a basket on the final possession of the half to go in with a two-point lead. And you go back with the starters – and Bryce, you were there. The lead went right back to 12, 14 points. Don Staley's having to call timeout. It's the one time. There's Keith, no weak it's the, one, it's the one time I felt that Dawn outcoached herself when she went back to the starters and didn't keep and didn't keep LA in on Clark. Um and um it, it that's it. And that team was great defensively. This team can get close to that and is just so much better offensively. I mean, I just think there's unfinished business for this team, and I think it's fueled by Raven Johnson because she was the most disrespected. And, I mean, you know, Caitlin Clark, Raven Johnson did hit 50% of her threes in that game, which was better than you did, okay? She was three for six. Don Stale yes. was quick yes. to point that out. <laughs> if Raven goes three for six and, against NC State and then in the championship game, we will take it. <laughs> It'll be I great. Agree. I mean, that stat line <laughs> – Raven Johnson against Indiana, five for seven from the field, three of three from downtown, six assists, no turnovers. I mean, in the Albany Regional, in the two games, she had 12 assists to only one turnover in those two games. And she got hammered with a god-awful second foul on a completely clean block shot in the first quarter. And South Carolina had to play the whole second quarter without her, which I do think affected um, the performance of the team. So, all right. Iowa LSU – we got to talk about it. The end of the first half, Angel Reese goes to the bench, tells Malky, get me the effing ball. I mean, I can't see Ashlyn Watkins ever screaming that in Dawn Staley's family. But guys, Let's think about this. LSU, their whole focal point, their eyes were in the wrong place because they were had three or four players watching Caitlin Clark and their play their player that they were supposed to be guarding ran right past them and Caitlin Clark dropped a pass in for a layup. I mean, your thoughts on that game and then Angel Reese declaring for the WNBA draft. And by the way, at the ESPYs last year, she did say that they would go undefeated and win another national championship. Denied. The stamp has been issued. LSU <clears throat> denied. And they never beat South Carolina. I love it. Um, Soft to lead us all. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, you're right, Bryce. They Angel never Reese beat South Carolina. Gopher. 
Like she is not. That, she didn't do it in Maryland. Didn't do it at LSU. Um, so I I thought it was a, I thought it was a great game. It like I said, it had a Final Four feel. Um, LSU was not you, you know as a three seed. You're you're ranked nine to twelve. They were probably one of the five best college basketball teams in the in the league this year. Um, but uh, but they were probably also justified as a three, and just a great game. I I thought that Angel Reese looked like she was going to go for you know forty points and thirty rebounds before she kind of hurt her ankle. She didn't look she didn't look all the same. Caitlin Clark pushed pushed her a little bit. On that play, um, you, you know that that patented where she drives and leads with that with, and and leads with that left arm. But I, um, as far as that game is concerned, I thought the telling factor is that if you're going to beat Iowa, you, you know Caitlin Clark can score forty points. I said this last year when we played them um, that you've got to shut down Iowa. It's fine if Caitlin Clark scores 40 points. It's fine. She needs to do it on 20 on on uh 25 plus shots, 30 plus shots. You know, if she's shooting 50, 60% from the floor, you're in trouble. Um, but you got to shut down the rest of Iowa. And um Stuckel and Martin for Iowa in this game are um are a total, excuse me, a, a falter and Martin for Iowa in this game go 13 for 26 from the floor for 37 points. That's where LSU lost the basketball game is, is those two beat them. And some of that was Caitlin Clark setting them up, you know, hitting them with like, she was, she played, she played one of her, one of the best games I've seen her play and her passing was on point. You know, she had those 12 assists were legit. And, uh, but, but she can go off. She can score 40 points. We just can't. You just can't have those starters having big games. Um, it's how uh, Sizanoa. I can never say her name, uh, but the power forward for them last year had 18 against us and had a dominant second half. And it felt like we were and and caused us to fight from behind all last year in the Final Four. Um, if we had shut her down and shut down some of the offensive rebounding she had done. We win. We potentially win the national championship last year. You got to shut down the rest of Iowa. LSU didn't do it. And Keith, that first half of Iowa LSU, outside of a Gamecock game, was the best half of basketball I've ever seen in women's basketball. The back and forth. You started the quarter in the first quarter. And Iowa had the best start you could think of, right? Clark hitting three, four threes. They get up 10 or 12, and you're like, is LSU going to lay down? But LSU's like this. No, we're going to go inside and dominate you inside. And you have it back and forth. What was it, a two-point game in the first, something like that? And then the second quarter, you had Iowa get up a little bit by little. And then LSU comes back. It was a great give-and-take game back and forth. And what I want in our game, if we would play Iowa in the final, you don't want her getting off to a great start. You don't want her hitting four or five threes to start and getting that confidence. You want her going one for seven, one for eight to start, because you know she's going to get hot in those games. You just got to make sure you're in her, in her business early on and getting her frustrated and she's complaining and she's doing more complaining to the refs than thinking about making a three-point shot. That's what you want, and that's how you beat Iowa. You saw teams like Indiana and Nebraska this year. They got so physical with her, she got frustrated, and she got off her game. That is how you beat them. They don't have the center this year that can pick and roll like the girl Sumter mentioned from last year. They are a team that loves the three. They can backdoor you occasionally, but the pick and roll, and that it's a different team that Iowa had last year. It's a team that's just – they're good on defense and they hit three-pointers. If you get physical with them, you can beat them in physicality alone. I mean, I tend to agree. So, I mentioned this earlier 
But in Caitlin Clark's previous six games prior to the LSU game, three in the Big Ten tournament in the first three rounds of the NCAA tournament, she was 29% from three. And part of the problem is, is you don't guard a six-foot juggernaut with a plotty five-foot-seven guard that is the smallest and least athletic player on your roster in Haley Van Lith. And that is why she got off early is because Haley Van Lith had nothing for her. And, you know, I'm interested to see, uh, you know, I mean, obviously you're going to roll different players. Gino will have to do it because to avoid the foul trouble, South Carolina, you know, can certainly do it. But for me, right, like Caitlin Clark, she had 29 field goals uh, attempts and 40 points, but she was nine for 20, 45% from three. You want her to go like five for 16, from three that's that's what you want and then you know think about it lsu lost by seven if um half alter has 10 instead of 16 and martin has 14 instead of 21 lsu wins the game but because they're they had bad eye discipline and on sight of their players, Caitlin Clark set them up for layups or wide open shots. I did not expect Gino Oriema or Dom Staley or Wes Moore to have that same game plan. All right, so let's move our thoughts and let's move. To- Keith, I wanted to ask you, what do you Go think? Ahead. I didn't um, yeah, what do you think, Keith, um, would be the best defender to put on Caitlin Clark if we played them in the final? Who would be that defender that we would need to shut her down? So I would probably start with Breezy Hall and uh, because Iowa's other guards are not that big. And then I would probably go with Full Wiley, um, Raven Johnson, Tessa Johnson. I think you roll somebody different, you know, every TV after every stop TV timeout and every under five timeout at the beginning of every quarter, I'm switching and putting somebody different on her unless I've just got somebody that is all up on her that I can keep rolling with. Um, I I think that is it. And then I think your bigs and your other players have to, you know, not allow their players to get easy shots. You have to do it. But before before that, I do have a little Jermaine Cousinard PTSD. And so let's talk about the first game on Friday, which will be South Carolina and NC State. Um, NC State 31 and 6. They were 13 and 5 in the ACC, 17 and 1 at home, 7 and 4 away, 7 and 1 on neutral sites. And Isaiah James had a performance for the ages in Portland. Uh, three of five in their uh, Sweet 16 win, and then unconscious, seven of nine against Texas, a total of 10 for 14, and she's shooting 34% from three on the season, and it's not even their best three-point shooter. That's Madison Hayes, who is almost 41%. But James has attempted the most three 
who's on their roster. She's 5'9". She's left-handed. She's athletic. She loves to go to the, the step back. But again, I look at NC State and only one player other than their starters plays more than seven minutes per game on average for the season. Isaiah James, 5'9", Sanai Rivers, 6'1", who is uber athletic, uh, you know, a 26% three-point shooter. So she has improved since I think she was one for 21 as a Gamecock, as a freshman. Um, you know, Mimi Collins, I don't know that she really scares me if Ashlyn Watkins is guarding her. River Baldwin shoots 54%, but I don't think she's gone up against the likes of Camilla Cardoso all season long. I mean, Elizabeth Kitley softer than a roll of Charmin, okay? We all know that. I just don't think NC State has faced anybody that plays defense like South Carolina, and that includes Texas, because you look out of that Texas team, they had nobody over 6'2", and that is not the kind of team you're going to see in future years from Vic Schaefer because they were not athletic like South Carolina is in the front court. I mean, I'm going to be honest. Chloe Kitts, I thought, was beyond her depth. This past weekend, I would expect Ashlyn Watkins and Sanaya Fagan probably to get more minutes than her. But in certain matchups, and especially when teams go to zone, I think she's effective. She just can't go to the block against more physical players than her. She's just not getting her shot off. It's it's some awful-looking fadeaway shot as she's falling down or the shot is getting blocked out of bounds. I mean, I, I did notice on the Gamecock media account, they had the five of Raven Johnson, Tahina Pow Pow, Breezy Hall, Ashlyn Watkins, and Camilla Cardoso. I have to think that's going to be the starting five on Friday night for the Gamecocks. Bryce, your thoughts and then Sumter. NC State, Baldwin and Collins, 6'5 and 6'3. If you get them in foul trouble, they don't have much else to bring in. You get them in foul trouble. Those are those two Carl, tall girls. That's how you, that's number one. You get them in foul trouble, they're in trouble. And then, as you mentioned, James and Rivers, they're the guards that make it happen. And whenever they take out, <clears throat> Collins or Baldwin, they go four guards because they want to beat you and be fast. Um, NC State wins games when they hit three-pointers. When they don't hit three-pointers, they don't win games. That's it. Is I know, uh, am I sound like a broken record? You just got to be physical with them. And Keith, like you mentioned, they haven't seen a team as physical as us. Texas was the softest number one team. Or in the last what ten years? I just I know they're coming in hot and you know momentum matters and it's all about getting off to a great start in the game, but shut down the perimeter, get their two tall girls in trouble and Collins and Baldwin win the game. What are your thoughts, Sumter? I kind of agree with both of you guys. Um if we if we play, play our game. We should win this game. Making three, if we're making three, we'll, uh, we'll be, and we should be able to win if we're playing our game. Uh, I will say this: if Sanaya Rivers does a Jermaine Cousinard impression, I'm quitting the pod. Like, like I'm just, I'm just, I'm just like, 
Like I'm, I'm just done. I'm, I'm done. Uh, uh, if, if she, if she starts heating up, I mean, the last time we saw her play, she went one for thirty-one from three during her only full season at Carolina. If she starts hitting up, heating up from three and starts making these shots, uh, I'm, just, I'm gonna throw something. Uh, like it's, it's gonna be so infuriating. But, but yeah. Uh, of course, you, you know, uh, Keith, we had our friend Kyle on on our uh, men's tournament preview pod. And and I, I it's like a wheeled into fortune, Kuznar going, going over 40. You know, that's the way that, that we lose. And um, I'm not to do that here uh, with, with Rivers. But if, you, you know, if they get hot, they can beat us. If we don't play our game, they can beat us. W- w- we're a double-digit favorite in Vegas for a reason. We're supposed to win this basketball game. I think they're going to go out and win this basketball game, and we're going to and we're going to wait and see who who we get in the final game. Like that's 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 where we I think we are with this game. And Keith, they only play six girls. Get them tired. They right. got to be tired. Get them tired. We can I think mean, about that's everything. Plus, I mean, no offense, no offense to River Baldwin. But she is the least athletic starting big in the Final Four, and it's not even close. I mean, she makes Reagan Beers look like Ashlyn Watkins. And that's hard to do. I, I mean, Texas was Gardner with a 6'2 player who was coming off a knee injury. And, I mean, plus you just – just had James with a superhuman. I mean, she was playing like LeBron James, who at 40 hit nine of 10 from three in a game uh, uh, earlier this week. So I think the key matchup to me is Madison Hayes and Tahina Pow Pow. I think if NC State is able to take Pow Pow out of the game offensively, I think you have to go quickly to Full Wiley and Tessa Johnson because, and we saw Dawn Staley do it, right? We saw her take out Chloe Kitts and put in Saniah Fagan, and we saw her uh, also sub in uh, Tessa Johnson. And late in that game, Pow Pow was not in the game. So... I think matchups are key. I think Cardoso should eat Baldwin alive. And if they start doubling and tripling her, I think Pow Pow, Raven, Breezy, you know, Breezy Hall's going to be in her home state, and she usually heats it up uh, when South Carolina plays in the state of Ohio. So moving to the nightcap, Okay, you're going to have the most talked about game. You're going to have Iowa and UConn. And to me, UConn has four players that average in double figures. Iowa has three. A six two power follow. She went to who is a big physical post player. But the matchup everybody's talking about is Paige Beckers and Caitlin Clark, but to me. Iowa has no answer for Aaliyah Edwards. And if you crowd her, you leave Ashlyn Shade and Nika Mule wide open for threes. And, I mean, they they make their threes. So, Sutter, your thoughts on that matchup? Uh, who do you think wins that game? And who is uh, outside of Beckers and Clark? What's the key matchup that you're paying attention to? 
the key matchup that I'm the, the key matchup that I'm paying attention to is Aaliyah Edwards versus the rest of Iowa. Um, like obviously the show is gonna be Beckers and Clark. Uh, Aaliyah Edwards is the third best player on the floor. And um, you know, against against Southern Cal, uh they played great. Beckers had 28, Aaliyah Edwards had 24. Um if if she's playing like that, um, then UConn can win. And uh, Ali, like I, I think I said it earlier in the show, they looked about as good uh, Monday night as as they've looked in a while. And those, like, we haven't been talking about these players. We haven't really been talking about Aliyah Edwards a ton this season. She could have a coming out party on uh, Friday night. And I think that the. Um, Gino is going to have this team ready to play Caitlin Clark. It's not going to be like what we saw with LSU trying to just, you, you know, to, putting, putting Van Lith on Clark and trying to shut everybody else down. Um, Gino's going to have them ready to play. They're going to switch a bunch. He'll, he'll figure out how to keep them out of foul trouble. Or he'll just dare the officials to get them in foul trouble, which, uh, you know, we'll see if they're we'll, – it, it, it'll it'll be funny to watch Gino react to the officials liking another team more than his. That that, that would be a, that could be a lot of fun Friday night. Uh, but uh, but I think Aaliyah Edwards is the difference maker. If she goes for twenty plus and has a great game, uh, Beckers is going to play well. I think UConn can win this. I think I think UConn can win this. I think it's going to be close. I would not want to be gambling on this in Vegas. Uh, I would want to. I would want to stay away from it. I think either team could win. I would not feel good about either bet. And uh, if you think, Keith, you mentioned this, shouldn't all the starters on Iowa and UConn average in double figures when they all play thirty-eight minutes a game? You know, at a certain point, when you play the whole game, you can shoot ten percent on the floor and still hit ten, get ten points. Um, also, the storyline this game, they each play six. First team to get in foul trouble loses. That could be a storyline. And then you have games with Paige Beckers. When she's hot early and UConn gets that 10, 15-point lead, do you see Iowa forcing it to Clark? And when Clark forces it a lot, that's not when Clark's the best. It's when everyone on the team is scoring – and everyone's balanced, and they can't double team her or put the tall girl on her. It's it's going to be interesting to see if UConn gets up early and makes Iowa four shots. You could see UConn win this game by twenty points. But on the other end, you could see Caitlin Clark hitting eight, nine threes, even maybe five, six threes in the first half. They get up, and UConn just gets blown out of the gym. As Sumter mentioned, I wouldn't touch this with a six foot pole if you're betting on this game on who's going to win because no one knows who's going to win the media wants one team to win but the players that are playing on that court and the coaches they don't know who's going to win and i i am let's say a prayer for the refs on are they going to call a push off before a three-pointer between beckers and clark because if they did beckers and clark would foul out in the first court All right, so the, the thing I look at is three of UConn's five starters played all 40 minutes against Southern Cal. The two that didn't were Ashlyn Shade and K.K. Arnold, who were in foul trouble, which forced them to play Ice Brady and Cadence Samuels. Generally, they just play Cadence Samuels, who, by the way, I love. She is a phenomenal freshman uh, for UConn. And then, then you look, look at the Iowa, okay, starters. Af Alter, 37 minutes. Clark, 40 minutes. Marshall, 40 minutes. Martin, 39 minutes. And the only reason uh, Steckel didn't play 37 minutes was because she got in foul trouble. And O'Grady had 15 of her minutes off the bench when it normally would have been maybe five minutes. And so for me, they played the late game 
It's going to be a huge game. It's going to go down to the wire. And both teams are probably going to be playing their starters 38 to 40 minutes each. South Carolina plays the first game. Nobody's going to play more than 31 or 32 minutes. And so um, I like – I just like UConn in this game because I think they have – not only the second, but probably the third and the fourth best players uh, in the game. And I'm not so sure Paige Beckers is not the best player in the game. If you just look at the shooting numbers and percentages, Paige Beckers is the only player in the country to shoot over 50% from the field, over 40% from three, and over 80% from the free throw line and score more than 20 points per game. So I like UConn because of the supporting cast and in particular because of Aaliyah Edwards. I don't think Iowa has any answer for her. So it's prediction time. So I think we all kind of are leaning to UConn, but at the same time, you can't, can't count Iowa out because let's face it, there is an agenda, okay? You hear the national media and all the talking heads on ESPN talk about the one thing missing from Caitlin Clark's resume is a national championship. That's why I really hope it's UConn because then you don't have to worry about, well, are we going to have to not only beat Iowa, but beat the network and the officials as well? And I do think South Carolina beats NC State because I just think South Carolina has unfinished business. They're on a mission, and they just have better players and more players. So prediction time. Sumter, you first, then Bryce, then I'll go. Who is cutting down the nets? Sunday South. afternoon in Cleveland, and I think we're probably going to have a consensus here. South Carolina's cutting down the nets Sunday afternoon in Cleveland, and they beat UConn. That we, well, we're gonna we're gonna like surprise it, the media. We're gonna mm-hmm. surprise the media, and we're gonna rematch the 2022 national championship game. That's what we're gonna do. Well, for the sake like of my it. bracket. For the sake of my bracket and the sake of my trip to Cleveland, it's the Gamecocks over Iowa by this much. This much. One point. We beat Iowa by one point, and we shut down all the haters, and then we see Caitlin Clark crying and complaining to the refs going off the court. So I do think South Carolina cuts down the nets. I think it will be over UConn, but I would love to see uh, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat and Caitlin Clark running into one of our players and then flopping on the floor and faking another injury like she did when Ohio State stormed the court. That would be the best. Um, but the, the best I, I do think Don Staley has got what it takes, and I think South Carolina hats on Sunday afternoon and claims their third national championship. What is delayed is not denied, and Aaliyah Boston will be in studio. And even though she won't get her second one, it's just going to be a year later than everybody thought. And Dawn Staley will will come back with another national championship net lace. Keith, the best ending, the best. All right, guys, I can't thank you enough. The 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 best possible ending for this is. I can't thank you enough. We're cutting out. Sorry. That's okay. Give it to me. All right. So the best possible ending for this is Carolina playing Iowa. 
went in on a last second Raven Johnson three, and she waving bye to Caitlin Clark, Dame Lillard style. That's the best possible ending. That's the dream ending for the uh, for, for the Gamecocks in this tournament. No doubt about it. And Sumter Link, you get the last word on today's pod. We'll end it there, guys. Thank you so much. That would be such a dream come true. Uh, you guys, safe travels, uh, Bryce, to Cleveland. And uh, Sumter, all the best to you uh, and your team in your competition this weekend. And we'll all be watching. And uh, we'll look forward to catching up with you down the road to wrap up this season and look ahead to next season. So, Go Gamecocks, and uh, thanks again. You guys were fantastic. Thanks, Keith, for having on. We had a great time. Always a pleasure, Keith. GBO out. All right, that was my interview last night. We did have some uh, internet problems. Uh, Sumter's robotics team, they were in a hotel uh, for a competition that uh, is going on today. And so a little uh, rough there on the ending, but glad you guys got to see it. So while uh, that was going on, Dawn Staley continues to pile up the hardware. She was named Associated Press National Coach of the Year. And a little bit later today, the uh, Women's Basketball Coaches Association, the WBCA, uh, will give their player of the year and coach of the year awards. Of course, Caitlin Clark's winning all the player of the year awards. All right. So, um, a little bit earlier, uh, offensive line coach Lonnie Teasley and Carolina's two defensive line coaches, Sterling Lucas and Travian Robertson met with the media. Uh, Lonnie Teasley uh, talked about the biggest thing last year uh, or this year compared to last year is having a lot more depth. Uh, they've stressed cross-training a lot of the guys. One guy he did, a couple guys he did mention, uh, Torricelli Simpkins, the transfer from North Carolina A&T, and the uh, – True freshman Josiah Thompson also mentioning that this spring uh, Big Tree and Travon Ball did not get spring practice. And so instead of hurrying up and hurrying them through fall camp, now they're able to slow down and work with more guys. He really leans on Greg Adkins as much as the rules allow. And then he's really enjoyed working with new run game coordinator, Sean Elliott. Uh, between the high energy he brings and the football IQ, he's really been able to pick his brain. Sterling Lucas called out Kyle Kennard as a lot of guy that brings experience to the room, a lot of respect uh, with Gilbert Edmond returning. And they, they just have more guys and more talent. And he wants to be able to sub guys like they do in uh, hockey shifts. Uh, you know, Desmond Yumi Azulu brings a lot of length. But one of the biggest things he mentioned, Brian Thomas Jr., who played two years ago at 225 pounds, last year 235 pounds, is now 247 pounds at almost 6'3", got one of the best get-offs, and now with that in size, he can be more of a factor uh, on the edge as well. So whether it's a 3-3-5 or the four-man front, they're able to really use a lot of different guys and have a lot of depth. Travian Robertson talked about the same thing, talked about guys like T.J. Sanders, Boogie Huntley, Tonka Hemingway, and then to have you know, more experienced guys in DeAndre Jules from 
Pitt and Kelly Goodwine from Alabama and also Nick Barrett, uh, who's a returning guy and a bigger guy. They really feel like they've improved their depth and they have several guys that could play edge in the four-man front or that could play in the three-man front. And I would expect to see with guys like Gilbert Edmond and uh, Dylan Stewart, you could see the return of the Rabbits package when you have three or four defensive ends all in the game on – you know, definite passing down. So that's from the Gamecock uh, coaches today. Um, Dawn Staley, Tahina Pow Pow, and Breezy Hall met with the media. You can go and check that out online. And evidently Dawn Staley had the line of the press conference, which uh, I'll leave to all of you to figure out. Thanks to everybody who tuned in live and thanks to everybody that will listen to this uh, via Spotify, Apple podcast, iHeartRadio, wherever you get your podcast. This will be up uh, in the next few minutes after we drop off. And then tomorrow morning, WLTX uh, sports anchor in 2023, South Carolina Sportscaster of the Year, Chandler Mack will be with me live from Cleveland, and we'll break it all down and get uh, the his thoughts on the vibes he's picking up from South Carolina's players and from the other players at the Final Four. So again, for Sumter Link and Bryce Hedgecock, who's traveling to Cleveland today, this has been Keith Alsep, and this has been Gamecock Pod Live for April the 4th, episode number 1453. I'll be back tomorrow with Chandler Mack. God bless. Go Gamecocks. And you guys have a great rest of the day. Thanks for tuning in. I'm out of here.